My name's Sebastian. I'm from uh, Binomica Labs. We're a really tiny 501c3 nonprofit located in New York City. And we uh, essentially developed the um, software, hardware, wetware, and thoughtware necessary for amateurs to do publishable research. That's the umbrella goal. And um, at the same time, I'm also an independent researcher as part of Binomica Labs. So I do my own research things. I uh, uh, collaborate often with my research partner, the uh, uh, partner in crime on this Binomica Labs venture, Sung. And we, um, we both have different interests. Like for example, um, I work with this stuff, this weird green stuff. Um, so I love plants. I'm a genetic engineer as a way to pay bills, a plant genetic engineer. Um, I also push electrons from time to time, um, start, uh, basically teaching myself electrical engineering in order to build the tools that I couldn't afford uh, or don't exist. Like if you need a tube at a particular angle or something to rotate or something to heat, but it's not this big. Um, the ability to, um, to shift and manipulate um, circuits in order to do whatever you need is such an empowering skill that I highly recommend everybody in biology to at least dabble a little bit in electronics. It goes a long way. And for amateurs, it goes an extremely long way because you can buy broken stuff off eBay and there's a pretty good chance that you can fix it with enough time. Um, the bulk of the components that I have in my lab, like all the hardware, most of it is used or I flipped the used equipment on eBay and sold that in order to, uh, to make more money and then um, either bought brand new equipment or I kept the best ones for myself. So like the overwhelming bulk of my lab is used stuff that I either fixed or bought and just like refurbished essentially. Um, my ultimate goal is to work on these guys. So I want to be a flower designer one day. Um, but the tools and understanding to effectively design flowers as a as a uh, as truly as a field of design is not there yet so i have to put on my science hat and uh, pretend to be a scientist in order to develop these tools that i will use in concurrent in concurrency with the amateurs around me um, so i hold no formal degree of any kind i dropped out of college um, for family and financial reasons and essentially uh, taught myself from the ground up how to do biology especially how to do plant biology um, and that was, that was a really difficult like 15 years of hitting my head against the wall until I realized that like um, doing it together is more important than doing it yourself. And the sooner I started collaborating with people and started working with others, the, the faster my skill sets grew, um, the faster my, um, my interest in other fields increased. It was just a, it was a tremendous like eye-opening experience and is what also introduced me to the open source concept, right? Where uh, when I started with biology, the concept of open source tools and open source software for biology was fairly nascent, right? And a lot of the the, the people positing open source hardware were like seen as like radicals, which I, I thought was silly. But um, but either way, the the core the core focus of my talk today is to walk through a couple of the gadgets that I've built throughout the years um, in no particular time order, except for an increasing complexity. And the complexity is in just like things connected or the overall machinery that does the thing. So um, I'm going to start really small and work my way up. So I hope you enjoy. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. And then I also I'm going to link my GitHub, which has uh, a hardware repo that I update often. Um, since I'm in this electrical engineering kick, that's never going to go away. Um, I'll also have a whole bunch of DNA up there too, and eventually I'm going to incorporate poly into a lot of the flower engineering processes I have, because there's it's transcription factor hell, and I just want something to neatly sort this. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, this is uh, an image of like my lab day to day. Is like petunias and pipettes and little robots and stuff. But uh, essentially, the core of what I what I what I do is explore the natural world through whatever means I have, and then share with everybody on whatever channel I can find. Um, and in the the process, I hone my abilities, but then also I start realizing that there's a lot of hardware that's missing, or a lot of um, particular. Um, facets of research that are either way too expensive or way too uh, inaccessible for the amateur, especially amateurs in countries that don't have access to a reliable cold chain or they charge ex incredibly high taxes for moving very cheap goods from one country to another. Um, so here's basically a, uh, a slight little diatribe on uh, patents and how, how to break costs, essentially. So we'll start with this. Um, so one of the simplest devices I've made was literally just a bunch of LEDs plugged into a USB. It's a, a blue light transilluminator. It's used when in, uh, in um, it's used for visualizing agarose gels, in order to do um, molecular cloning, right? In order to do any type of molecular biology, chances are if you're working with DNA, you're going to run gels, and if you're going to run gels, you need to be able to visualize them. And gel docs, um, the simplest gel like gel illuminator, 
um, can go upwards of 600 bucks, right? So I got this one used off eBay a long time ago and the price kept on going up. And one day I put my gel in and it was a little too wet and a little bit of the TAE buffer got inside in between the lens, which is supposed to be waterproof. It's supposed to be waterproof. Um, and, it, and it wasn't, and it fried my system. So the first thing I did was I took out a screwdriver and took it apart, and lo and behold, it was just a bunch of resistors and a button. And that infuriated me, because how can you charge $600 for something that costs you less than $2 to build, right? Well, the answer is patents, right? So these folks have patented side illumination um, on top of a bunch of other things in one very convoluted patent that uh, upset me to no end. And so I decided to, instead of buying another one or just grunting and trying to buy something else, I thought I'd build it myself. Um, so the first thing I did was reverse engineer it, and this one was pretty simple. I took, um, I have a Thorlab spectrometer that I basically stole off eBay for like 200 bucks, um, and I put it to the LEDs coming from the transilluminator after I gave it a little power, and I saw that it was 471 nanometers, right? And 470 is royal blue, and that happens to be pretty common LEDs. So I found an LED that's exactly 471, even though the, the doc says 470. It's on point 471, and it's about 30 cents. So I went on Tinkercad, my favorite 3D design tool. It's designed for kindergartners to develop things for 3D printers. So it's perfect for idiots like me that can't use software as well. Um, and it's specifically, it's mission specific for, for um, uh, uh, what's it called? For, for, for kids and learning, specifically for 3D printing. Um, so the f first thing I started doing was just cobbling some LEDs together. So I bought one, uh, I put a resistor in series because you have to limit the current or else the, res the, the LED is just going to poof and the magic smoke escapes. And as we know, if the magic smoke escapes, the electrons fall out and it doesn't work anymore. So you got to keep the magic smoke inside the LED and this helps. Um, I made a, a, a ton of them, enough to like circle the uh, gel region of my gel box. I 3D printed a design, soldered it all together and um, then I spent about three weeks buying different acrylics to try to figure out what light filter did they use because the um, the the blue light transilluminators require a blue blocker to um, to block out the excitation wavelength so you can see the fluorescence coming up from the um, let me leave chat on just in case um, the uh, so you can have the excitation wavelength. Um, I mean, the excitation wavelength is canceled and the emissions uh, wavelength is coming through, right? So the excitation is blue and I use a dye called gel green, which is um, super safe. It can't pe uh, penetrate the plasma membrane as opposed to cyber safe or worst case, ethidium bromide. So it's not toxic, um, not as toxic. Don't drink it, obviously, but it's a hell of a lot safer and you can throw it down, uh, down the drain. You can throw it in the trash. There's no hazmat. So I really like it and I designed around that. Um, the catch is you excite it with blue light and then it emits green light. So you need something that allows you to pass the higher wavelengths, a high pass filter. And it turns out that there's this particular acrylic called 2422 Amber Acrylic that is the best blue blocker for this. And this is actually what uh, folks like the mini PCR uh, people do. People use the um, MB Tech folks. Uh, down below you actually see an NBTEC panel on the left and on the right side is just a big old slab of acrylic 2422 and it actually does a better job, right? It illuminates the gel better. So I'm like, cool. Um, these LEDs are 33 cents. You need about 50 of them, so it's pretty cheap. Um, the acrylic panel is about $6 for one square foot and really you just need this much to cover your phone so you can get smaller pieces because at the end of the day we want to take a picture of it, not just stare at it, right? Um, and so, so basically I found a better plastic and a way cheaper design. So in my infinite wisdom, I decided to share this on Twitter and said, you know what? I'm just gonna build this for people. If anybody wants it here six, uh, for 64 bucks, right? That's basically two times the cost of the materials. The LEDs uh, end up not discounting in bulk. So it does, it does cost me a bit. Um, I, I tweeted this and it kind of went viral within the, uh, uh, within the, within my little bubble of scientists got about like 4,000 likes and ended up being about 1,000 orders. 1,000 people uh, requested me to build this and it takes me about two hours to build it. So um, legend has it that to this day, I'm still building these orders. Um, so lesson learned, don't, <laughs> don't advertise unless you can actually mass produce. Now I don't want to vi violate a patent, so I'm skirting around the patents by specifically avoiding a PCB, specifically avoiding lensing and doing everything freeform. Right? And in doing so, it's kind of like an art sculpture piece, so uh, maybe I can argue it if I ever get a cease and desist, but um, I hate patents. So, um, so that was one. The second one, so I found out recently, not, not too long ago actually, that if you use methylene blue, this particular microscope stain, 
and you expose it to light, specifically 660 nanometer light, um, it produces free radical oxygens, oxygen singlets that are mutagenic, right? And I said, wait, um, most, most mutagens are carcinogens, but this one is a selective mutagen where it only activates its mutagenicity in a specific situation. This might be one of the safest ways to induce mutagenesis in an organism. Um, and, and so I decided, all right, let me, let me build something that is super simple. It just holds an LED on one side. It holds a, a PCR tube with a sample on the other. And then you have cells in there or plasmids. Um, and the methylene blue you can buy like 500, like 100 grams for $5 or something. It's, it's absurd and you don't need much. And so I drafted some stuff on my notebook. Um, I spent a, way too much time trying to figure out the, um, uh, the angle of the PCR tube because some patents say 13 degrees, some 17. I said, eh, 13, sure, 13 degrees. Um, and so after a little bit of rapid prototyping, um, I wired up some 660 nanometer LEDs. I bought them online, uh, put them on a breadboard and used two, uh, three samples. This one just shows two, but I did three samples and I exposed them to either the light on, the light off with methylene blue or without, right? And uh, this was the result of these two samples. Um, ML means methylene blue and light. M is just methylene blue without light. And you can see on the left side that the tube actually got clearer, right? And in that clarification is the reaction. So the methylene blue is reducing and re releasing oxi uh, oxygen radicals as a result. Those smash into everything. And if you, uh, if you run DNA on a gel, so from left to right is methylene blue and light, methylene blue, no light, uh, no methylene blue, yes, light. So on the left side, I swear to God, there was DNA there. I promise, right? It was obliterated. This thing is, an, is a wonderful shredder. If you don't have DNAs, adding a bit of methylene blue will just shred whatever DNA you have in there, along with everything else. Um, so I have to tune it. And so in that, in that concept of tuning, I said, all right, you know what? Um, Let's try, let's try first uh, transforming it. And so I transformed those three samples that I reacted and methylene blue with light, I got nothing. Methylene blue without, um, without light still gave me less colonies and then just light without methylene blue gave me essentially a lawn. So there was a reaction even without light, like stray photons or it wasn't covered that well. Whatever it is, um, it's reactive. And so and this was plasmids that I transformed. The next step would be to actually incorporate um, um, Whole, whole cells, like like put E. coli in a tube, blast it with methylene, uh, blast it with red light, add methylene blue, and um, you can essentially do not not necessarily directed evolution, but just like a really strong mutagenic pressure without risking you getting cancer. Um, this was actually this uh, the carcinogenicity of of methylene blue or the free radicals was actually discovered in endoscopy. So there's a special kind of endoscopy, which is a procedure to um, run a camera down your throat, essentially. And in order to spot particular kinds of tumors, they would stain your throat inside with methylene blue, and those tumors would not bind. The methylene blue won't bind, so they'll, they'll stick out as like beige material on a blue background. Now, the endoscope light is using a tungsten light bulb that is essentially full spectrum. And what they noticed is that the, end, the endoscopy procedures were, were causing tumors. So the, the, the hunt for tumors was causing tumors. Cool. Uh, in that paper, they, disco they discovered that if they use a, a blocker that blocks out red light, right? So red blocker, um, it drastically reduced the tumor formation in vitro, in vitro. So they were saying, if you just put a filter on your endoscope, um, that could drastically increase patient outcomes from you know, uh, unwanted carcinogenic effects. So um, taking that hint, I kind of decided to design a little bit of a device, super, super simple, a bunch of switches, uh, knobs that just turn it from off to max power and a bunch of holders. And that's an ongoing project. I won't get into the, the details because like each one of these projects I can talk on and on and on about um, individually. I have a whole bunch of data for different ones and I'm gonna update that as soon as I can. Um, but this was really simple. It was such a easy KiCad job. So KiCad is the um, um, electrical engineering open source tool that's now sponsored by CERN. So it's here to stay. Uh, it's entirely free, it's super powerful and I use it for everything. So when I first started learning electrical engineering, I started um, with like breadboards and I never really had the confidence to work with PCBs. And then I took a, a simple course on, I think it was, uh, where was it? It was on Udemy, right? And it was like KiCad like a pro, right? And it was like the simplest class. And after I took that, I'm just like, wow, I know how to make PCBs now, cool. That just expanded my horizon of, of technologies that I could develop. Um, so that, I highly recommend it, KiCad. Um, the, the next one is called the mini-spec. So typically in a molecular biology lab, at some point you use spectrophotometers. 
Now, the issue with spectrophotometers is that they're stupidly expensive. And um, they all have their purposes, right? You dial in a wavelength and you, you measure your sample. It passes light through and it measures how much light was removed from the sample versus the light passing through a blank, a control. And, uh, and that uh, particular co uh, concentration based off of a mathematical model will tell you something about what's going on in there. Either you're measuring chlorophyll or protein concentration or whatever. And it's dependent on the wavelength. Now, um, the most routine molecular biology wavelength that everybody uses is 600 nanometers, right? Uh, the optical density measurement at 600 nanometers is what people use to measure the, the rough concentration with arbitrary units, and uh, I can get into that a little later, um, the rough concentration of how much cells of E. coli are in your sample. And the, uh, the issue there is that if you're an amateur biologist and you want to do molecular biology, uh, and you want to make competent cells, making E. coli able to, absorb, to take up plasmids, you need to catch them at a particular stage in their growth curve, right? As they're growing, when they're super, super healthy and rapidly dividing, and their membranes are not that intact because of the constant division, um, that's the perfect condition to, to, um, uh, to ingress plasmids. So, but you need to measure that. You can't just look, I mean, after like maybe 20 years of biology, you can guesstimate. Like I'm, I'm okay with optical density. I'm normally off by like 0.05 when it comes to it, so like I can eyeball it, but I also know my strains really well. I know at exactly four hours, NAB turbos in my lab will be at 0.5, um, so that's handy. But if, you, if you're if you just starting out and need, you need this device, you're gonna pay you know $1,000 for something to read a single wavelength of light. And so I said, um, what if we just use a single mo a monochromatic LED, an LED that produces that wavelength where the, the, the distribution, the Lorentzian distribution of that light is super tight. So it's not a laser, but it's good enough for what we're trying to do. And so uh, I started designing, and uh, on my notebook, um, basically was trying to think, okay, we use cuvettes. Cuvettes are the, 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 uh, the workhorse of spectrophotometry, and it's this tiny little square. Um, it's uh, no taller than like two inches, and it's 10 millimeters on a side, uh, the light path. And so I essentially thought of a super, super tiny uh, two-button spectrophotometer that just measures the amount of orange light going through your sample. Uh, and so and so I started designing. This is one of my earlier um, prototypes. And so I didn't have the confidence to order PCBs online, so I started hand etching it. Uh, and the image is actually my mom helping me with the etching. She's uh, uh, my lab manager and my like best science student, and she loves doing this stuff. She's super curious, even though she's almost 70 years old. Um, so I use um, photoresist, which is a film that goes on top of uh, copper. And when you put a when you put a uh, stencil, a transparent stencil on top, it acts like a photograph and it solidifies the area where, um, where light touches. So by, by doing that, you use, uh, you use light to solidify areas and mask parts of copper such that you can cut out your circuit. And then you use a mix of either vinegar and peroxide or hydrochloric acid, dilute hydrochloric acid and peroxide um, to eat away the copper and the things that are covered remain. And what results is, is, is a circuit, which you can then cut and drill holes and do stuff. And so I came up with this, right? Like super, super simple design. I found a really awesome light sensor that does light to digital. So you don't have to do all the analog black magic involved in, um, uh, in measuring light, like photodiodes and trans impedance amplifiers, all that crazy stuff. It's all embedded in the circuit. So all you need to do is have a microcontroller go, hey, uh, what's, the, what's the value on this? And it just gives you an actual number directly. All the conversion of analog to digital is on this chip. It's wonderful. And it's now like extremely out of stock because of COVID stuff. So I wish I could have shipped this and actually sold it in my Etsy store, but I can't because I have four part, five parts left essentially. And uh, very, very, um, very few avenues to actually get these parts. But either way, like I can't wait. In, um, in about a year, I'll be able to ship this and it's gonna be wonderful. Um, so essentially the design is a light sensor, an LED passing through it. Um, so I decided to make a casing for it. Here's a, an image of, of Tinkercad. Super simple. Just make, make some cutouts in order for the two sensor pieces to slide on. And I thought, because we have this monochromatic LED, and LEDs come in many different wavelengths, what if you make it modular? What if you could swap out the LED manually and then take, a, like, take apart the device, swap out the LED unit, and replace it with something else, and now you have a different color? Let's say instead of... Um, uh, what's it called? Instead of 600 nanometers for um, for optical density, you do 450 nanometers for Bradford assays or whatever. Um, you can literally lift the two components off, the light sensor and the LED, and swap them with whatever you want. 
right? I was even thinking of having these like weird wheels of different sensors and different lights that you can turn. And so it's like dial a color, essentially. So it's like a poor man's spectrophotometer, but it's enough and you can actually do good data, uh, good research with it. Um, and so I did some testing. Um, I hooked it up to an Arduino and wrote some really basic code in order to actually take the sample and then use the Beer-Lambert law in order to um, assess the optical density. Uh, and I used oxalic acid, uh, one of my favorite compounds. When you mix them with calcium, it crashes out into an insoluble sand that's about like uh, one to ten mi uh, no, one to two microns in diameter, which is kind of perfect because E. coli is around that size. Um, and they don't really absorb much light, they're very, very white and they're opaque. So you can use that opacity as a way to calibrate, right? Like how many oxalic acid units is an optical density unit and then calibrate. So I did a whole bunch of math. Uh, the linear regression, the R squared value is uh, 0.99, which is good enough, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining. Um, but more importantly, this, this entire device cost me like $2.50 maybe to produce, right? As opposed to, you know, $1,100 $1, or more. Um, so that was that was one of my favorite little devices, and I put in a little screen, and you can. This is a rough prototype without any any soldering, and just essentially connect everything to a small Arduino Mini, um, and uh, yeah, and it just it just works, and it's really really fun. So, um, going along that logic, I said, okay, this is for a single shot. What about the ability to measure uh, cultures as they grow? Right, which is kind of a holy grail for molecular biology, is trying to find a way to accurately measure the optical density in a flask super quickly, ideally inside the flask. Now, um, I'm working on ideas for that, for like autoclavable sensors, a whole suite of autoclavable sensors that you can pop in, which is cool. Um, but in the, in the meantime, I still needed to measure growth curves because I had a project where I was studying media, like uh, actually behind me over there, is a bunch of media bottles of varying concentrations of different uh, um, ingredients, and I wanted to see how E. coli respond to there, uh, respond in that media. And so normally you would make a growth curve. This is a really generic, oversimplified version of what a growth curve looks like. When you put cells into a solution, they hang out for a little bit, they start dividing extremely rapidly, then they plateau as the nutrients or their population uh, reaches a particular equilibrium, and then they start dying, right? But the, uh, the issue there is that if you want this curve, you would have to take a sample out of your flask every hour, right? One single data point every hour manually in order to do this. Um, and that's a lot of grad, grad student time and effort all to get a growth curve. And plus, you're only getting one data point per hour. That's 24 data points if you really want to stay up all night. Um, and so I said, okay, there's these really cool orchid culture tubes, these plant tissue culture tubes that are 25 millimeter round and about 150 millimeter tall, and they have a cap that's vented, right, Kim caps. Um, and so I designed a, a, a chassis around that and utilized the same exact light sensors from my single shot um, and essentially built a, a modified version of the single shot that you can then throw into your shaker and allow it to actually read as it grows. So you get an overnight curve and instead of taking a sample physically out of the tube, you read directly through the tube, which is super handy, um, because then you don't reduce um, you don't reduce volume, and the entire thing goes into um, the entire culture gets considered uh, in your growth curve, right? You're not slowly reducing volumes, and so the smaller the volume that you start with, the the larger the drops, the less accurate your growth curve is going to be. So in order to uh, uh, accommodate for that, I'm just shining directly through and reading it. And uh, because I was designing this, I'm just like, why don't I make everything like uh, kind of like Legos in a, in a way and friction fit all the parts together using old timey uh, analog camera light seals using black velvet and, uh, and magnets. So the entire device, there's no screws or anything. It fits very snugly. Um, and uh, all you have to do is replace the velvet every like maybe two years. And it's extremely cheap if you need to uh, attach it to a magnet throw it on your shaker. This is one example of it wired up. Um, I'm, the latest iteration is going to have a microcontroller built into each, each and every single one of these tubes, um, and they'll be able to be controlled through a daisy chain via just four wires that you can just snake underneath your, um, your incubator shaker. And uh, the beautiful part of this curve, I mean, about this uh, the system is that it generates gorgeous curves. This is an actual agrobacterium curve from last year uh, measured for about 38 hours, right? And this isn't a fit line. This isn't some type of an equation. This is actual raw data. This is a reading taken every second for 38 hours, right? So like 13, 136,000 seconds worth of data. And I know that sounds silly and overkill, but if you look really carefully, there's some blips and bumps that aren't noise, right? And um, 
a uh, long, long time ago, because uh, this project's been ongoing for many years, a uh, long time ago I gave a talk on this one blip that we've been exploring, and we're getting closer and closer to understanding what this blip is, because there have been many, many publications of growth curves that show this blip, but I haven't found anybody addressing what it is. We take it for granted as noise. Um, when I first saw this blip, I thought it was like my dog bumped the shaker or something, but it ended up being reproducible, so much so that it's in, uh, it can be moved depending on media, uh, it has different characteristics and different cell types, and we're going to explore different microbes. And yeah, this is just a really long, long, long burn ongoing project. Um, but it sure beats staying up all night and taking a reading every hour manually, right? Um, one nice thing about it is that because the light sensors are I squared C, it's a particular electronics uh, hardware control protocol, you can daisy chain essentially as many as you'd like. There's a limitation, but you're not, there's, there, um, there's like a hard limitation, but it's really, really large. And one of the really interesting parts about this is that you can use the same chip to make a plate reader. So one of the things in the, in the back burner right now, because I, I can't have access to a ton of these light sensor chips, um, is to build a really cheap plate reader for like ideally under 400 bucks, where you just put in your 96 well plate, it has 96 uh, light sensors, 96 con programmable LEDs or laser ports or whatever you'd like, and you have the super modular plate reader um, as opposed to like $4,000 for like a really crappy one right a really crappy commercial version and i'd like it to be open source because there's not that many open source plate readers and a lot of them assume really tremendous amounts of uh, electronics costs right and a few people are actually spinning their own boards so i'd like this to be a nice open source project where people can actually do high throughput research as an amateur um, and one of the most important tools in high throughput research is a plate reader okay um, recently i had this, i've been on this kick of um, simplifying right as much as possible and reducing to bare essentials it's it started as a thought exercise of like what is the minimum viable product to do a particular thing in a lab right and for spectrometers i came up with this idea called the better than nothing turbidoscope so um so i started i started designing like okay so we're going to hold the leds and the light sensor here and we're going to use um 10 leds to denote the optical density in units and then we're going to use this one interesting chip so it came out in the 80s, and it's a, it's a decade uh, voltage divider. So essentially, you give it a voltage, and it will output 10 levels of that voltage, right? 10 even cut levels of that voltage, and it compares your input and turns on lights. It's essentially a bar graph uh, LED driver, right? It's super, super cheap. Uh, it's entirely analog. There's absolutely no programming necessary. Hold on one sec. There's like a weird military helicopter. Um, Cool. Um, so it's it's extremely cheap. It's entirely analog. There's no coding, and it cost me less than a dollar to assemble the entire the entire structure. And so I built a super rough prototype um, where I hand etched this thing. I was using very random through hole resistors, and you have three knobs, right? So you have the upper range, the lower range, and then your calibration in the center. And the reliance, uh, the important part of this is to calibrate because you have no numerical value. And to be fair, spectrometers need to be calibrated against something because it, when you see a publication and it just says optical density units with no calibration, it actually doesn't mean anything because every single spectrometer has variations in their reading. So from machine to machine, you'll get a different spectrometer reading, right? So like um, uh, most people calibrate with um, facts, like cell sorting machines that actually count the cells and calibrate optical density to cell count. You can use a hemocytometer or you can simulate the optical density itself, right? So now, um, going back to oxalic acid, that precipitate that makes liquid cloudy, if you use oxalic acid and calcium, it produces this precipitate, and that precipitate uh, will occlude light. Now, an optical density of 0 0.5 is the transmission of about 32%. So about a third of the light is passing through uh, at the moment where, where your bacteria is, is the happiest, essentially, which is a, a number that varies with with um, growth conditions and is not as clean cut, right? So we, we, we kind of fast, we use this fast and loose and it's a little bit frustrating, but that's a difference, that's an aside. Um, so you, de you design a, a standard curve, you determine how much um, of, of calcium oxalate you need to get an optical density of 0.5, and then you can make a solution, right? So the ultimate goal is to have two solutions that when you mix together, makes your standard. You shake up your standard, you put it in there, and you align the LED such that only the green light turns on. That's dead center uh, uh, OD of 0 0.5. Now, when you put in another, when you put in your bacterial sample, a different LED will turn on either above or below that. And you don't need to know 
essentially above or below optical density of 0.5, you need to know just how much. Is it about to be 0.5 or is it overshot? Right? And ideally, just dead on what is 0.5. So you have a single calibration point, the only point that matters, and you have this super, super basic um, uh, analog system uh, harking back to like the TTL logic days um, with absolutely no necessary programming with a board that's single-sided, meaning that you can home etch this yourself. So, and it, it runs off of a USB. So if you get a USB cable off Alibaba, the chips are like uh, five bucks for like a hundred or something like that last I checked. Uh, LEDs are pennies, resistors are also pennies. Um, the only ones that are slightly more expensive are the little knobs, um, but I'm looking for different ways to remove that entirely. But essentially, this is the the cheapest possible optical density unit uh, imaginable, right? Like there's there's literally nothing else that will actually drive a a, um, a diode, a photodiode, and read its voltage and give you some type of a visual indicator without having a screen. Um, and that that theme of simplifying and the um, the concept of better than nothing is turning into a really interesting um, kind of design philosophy of not, oh, uh, because you're broke, you don't deserve good stuff. But it's like, if you have nothing, can you do science? Can you do science with just like a cup and some string, right? Like what is the, um, what kind of publishable research can you do with minimal tools, right? And that, that's just been like the, the biggest focus for me recently. Um, I also designed a nice uh, uh, PCB for everything so that you can just order it if you'd like. Uh, all this is on my GitHub. Um, and what well, the coolest part, <laughs> um, so I was using my uh, big spectrometer to calibrate and verify my little spectrometer. And I'm actually using the USB port in my big spectrometer to power my little one. So it's like parasiting off of it, which is really fun. The, um, the entire thing is, is essentially just trolling the, the massive cost of spectrophotometers and um, how we can actually better assess this for, from an amateur biology standpoint to do just, just the thing we need. Um, okay, uh, next one's the Cabbage Babbage. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but um, the Babbage engine is a mechanical computation device. And uh, MIT Media Lab did this thing called the food computer, right? Uh, which didn't go, didn't go too hot, but I liked, I liked that word and I wanted to kind of do a, a tongue in cheek on it. So instead of the food computer, it's the Cabbage Babbage. And the reason why I said cabbage is because I've been obsessed with, uh, with uh, these plants called Brassica, Brassica rapa. Right, uh, this like mustard green, and there's a version of Brassica rapa called the Wisconsin Fast Plants Astro Plants, and they're basically bred to be extremely small, and they flower in like 15 days in ideal conditions, right? And you get about seed to seed in a month, which is super fast. And I've been really wanting to produce a um, a model organism for amateurs to do flower engineering with a really, really rapid turnaround and not much. Uh, not much ado. Like, it's not tobacco because if it's tobacco, it's regulated in some country, so I can't send seeds. Um, it's not weedy. It uh, it's it's not dependent on a whole bunch of stuff. You can actually grow it in a soda cap, right? Like one of those two-liter soda caps. You can grow it inside there. It doesn't need much soil, and uh, you can just use Osmocote fertilizer pellets, which are everywhere, generic per fertilizer pellets, and just adding that, they'll grow just fine. I think um, Keone, if I'm not wrong, you grew some task plants at one point. Um, so to, to give a bit of perspective, the, the um, equipment necessary to climate control plants for, for research purposes are extremely expensive. I mean, upwards of $18,000 in some cases, when if you look really carefully, it's one of those like deli fridges with some lights in it right and like a thermostat really like this is overly complicated some people actually use the bodies of standard refrigerators and retrofit it with stuff and then sell it for four thousand dollars that's crazy um so here are my plants um and i grow them under constant light and the nice thing about brassica rapa is that you don't need to uh, change the photo period it just stays on all the time um and they're, they're growing really happily, but I have to remember to water them. And irony of ironies, I suck at plants. I'm, I'm actually not good at keeping plants alive, uh, which really sucks for my future career. But um, in order to replicate some parts of this, um, this growth chamber, I decided to like automate the process. So the first thing I did was try to measure the uh, amount of water, but not by measuring the water level, but by measuring the actual uh, the, the moisture of the soil, right? And so there's these really cheap capaci uh, capacitive sensors that essentially read the, uh, the capacitance that builds up by putting something conductive and wet next to the device. And it gives a signal, uh, an analog signal, which you can then read. Um, these things are extremely cheap. You can daisy chain as many as you'd like, and it just runs off of an Arduino. So I took some time to measure um, 
the drying and the, the, the wetting point, right? So down means wet, up means dry, right? So uh, as, as it gets more wet, the uh, ADC units go down, right? So the big, red, the big red arrow at the beginning is me adding water. It quickly drops. It uh, supersaturates, right, as the water slowly creeps up onto the soil, and then it levels out, and over time it starts dehydrating, right? And I wanted that window. I wanted to know, like, is it constant? Does it change? And it does change with temperature. Uh, but these sensors are pretty reliable. So I thought, why don't I make an auto-watering system for this, for this thing, to add a little bit? So I bought a whole bunch of these guys. Uh, I got an LCD screen, a water pump, a bunch of um, uh, uh, an Arduino with like this shield that allows you to connect a whole bunch of three three wire components, um, and started coding a little bit. Really basic like like Babby's C in um, it's like a simplified version of C for Arduino that allows you to interface with hardware. Uh, and so I set up this rig. I got some Amazon crates. There's these like wireframe boxes that they sell for like shelving, right? And they're super handy because they're like uh, about 16 inches in a square. And it fits the light panel that I use perfectly, so it was like made for this. And then I found the 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 only aluminum pan that perfectly fits this. So everything just kind of lined up to have this like really neat um, and kind of pretty way to automate growth. So this system can monitor 16 plants and determines the average moisture across all of them, and then turns on a watering uh, a watering pump uh, when it's necessary. And it maintains humidity, temperature. It, it logs it to an SD card. It measures humidity, temperature, uh, the changes in that, and then the health of the sensors, because you're comparing it to where it was when you first started, in case there's sensor deg degradation. Uh, it doesn't need to be this complicated, but um, I've had about 14 generations now with this uh, Cabbage Babbage system, and it's been wonderful. Um, uh, that entire water tank fills, um, holds enough water to go one week above an entire growth cycle. Right, where on day 15 you hand pollinate, and on day 30 or 40, depending on your humidity, um, you harvest your seeds. So with one water tank and a press, press of one button, it will grow to seed these plants. Right, And you can put this into a mini fridge and have a thermostat and actually have a really decent uh, plant growth chamber with no soldering and a bunch of stuff off of Amazon, or if you want it even cheaper, stuff off Alibaba. Um, here's some data from it. The sensors need a little bit of uh, calibration because each one has a particular offset because of the manufacturing faults of these cheap sensors. Um, so you have to adjust them in post. You can subtract or, or add to it, essentially average it, and then remove the signal from it so that you can calibrate all of them to a particular standard. Every single plant will have a slightly different calibration offset, which you can then, you can then utilize. And uh, you can even see that the curves of some of them um, don't overlap they do other things so because of like va random variations within the soil because the soil i'm using is is, is complex media really bulky the humidity varies um pretty significantly so sometimes you actually see strange effects but it's not because of the the sensor itself it's because the actual soil is retaining moisture in a different way let's see okay and now the last one i want to talk about and the one that uh, got me all the way here to talk to you guys today is the bioblade so um, bioreactors, they're expensive. They're so, so expensive. The consumables for bioreactors are expensive. The little dumb bottles that spin are like $500. Um, some of the plastic disposable bioreactors are like 700, 700 bucks for like 10 of them or something like that. It's nuts. Um, so I was, I've been thinking a lot about bioreactors and because I had a client coming up that needed me to express a whole bunch of recombinant protein for a project. I'm still under NDA, so I can't talk about it, but it's really cool, uh, and it involves hair. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so I, ha I had to basically produce uh, four liters of uh, E. coli culture in like two weeks, and I was kind of crapping myself. I'm just like, oh crap, I don't have enough flasks. My incubator doesn't fit. It's enormous. Uh, I mean, it, it's an it's enormous amount of volume. What do I do? And so I was uh, brushing my teeth, and I was holding on to this, and I kind of stared at it for a while, and I said can I make a bioreactor out of this? Can I like turn a bottle into a bioreactor? Is that possible? And so I was just like th sitting there and like rotating it around. And I noticed that it was, <clears throat> it, it was kind of like a rectangle, right? Where it's narrower on one side. I'm like, what if you take some like heating mats and heat both sides to warm the bottle from the outside so you don't have any ingress inside. And then just like maybe use an aquarium pump or something to bubble 
because you don't in a bioreactor you don't need to stir the cells you need to oxygenate the media and so if you have an aquarium pump that bubbles air into the media you're doing essentially what the stirring motion does that's how fish stay alive because the solubility of oxygen in liquid water is garbage so you need to constantly sparge oxygen gas in order to enrich the the uh, the water with oxygen um, as an aquarium same thing for a bioreactor so I went on Amazon, I started shopping around, and I started cobbling together a little um, uh, shopping cart. And uh, the most important thing I found was this five liter carboy that is like two inches wide and, and flat, right? I'm like, this is perfect. I have, I have these like reptile heating lamps from when I used to own a snake, these heating pads, sorry, that I could just like glue onto the side of it, tape it down, put in, um, uh, put in like a heating, ele uh, I mean, put in a, um, an aquarium bubbler, on a thermostat and call it a day and so they came like next day everything was next day prime I was, I was pretty excited for that um, they came in so I looked at the bottle I'm just like okay this is five liters to the very top but the very top is the opening and I need a foam stopper because I need the air to come out somewhere so I, d I decided on four liters which is perfect because that's what my client needed so I slapped these um, uh, these heating mats onto the bottle and turned it on and I noticed I, I thought seven watts would be enough seven watts on either side 14 watts total and it ended up being terrible it was not that good and uh, that good for heating water because unfortunately water has one of the highest if not the highest specific heat capacities of all liquids so you need a lot of energy to heat water right something like four what was it uh, 4,000 joules per gram per degree Celsius I forget the specific heat capacity but um, it's pretty significant and because of that that notion it takes a lot of energy for a microwave to heat up water 25 degrees in a minute right it's like a thousand watts to heat up a, a cup of water to 70 degrees celsius in a minute from room temp um, that's nuts so i thought like oh maybe i can just do it slow so these things were kind of garbage uh, then i found this so this was um, an absolute stroke of luck i found these really awesome uh, 3d printer heated bed platform silicon heating mats that are that fit perfectly around this bottle they're 12 volts at 220 watts, so not 7 watts, 220 each. And I did the math, and that totaled to about 40 amps of power, uh, I mean, 40 amps of current going through these things. Um, now, this is the, the highest current system I've ever built thus far, right? And I've never worked with high current systems, and so there's a lot of things that you need to consider. And uh, one of them is selecting your driver to, um, in a way that actually tolerates the amount of power that goes through this thing. And so, okay, so I bought a, a thing on Amazon that was at 40 amps, and I'm just like, okay, 38 amps is lower than 40, this should be fine. And immediately my mom's like, you're gonna need this. So she gave me a fire extinguisher, we put it in there, and we let it run for about an hour. And of course, an hour later, the thing caught fire, right? So this tiny thing that was rated for 40 amps is actually rated for 20 amps. I did a little digging, and the chip is rated for 20. So they're, they're, they're improperly selling it. Um, it smelled horrible. This was like, it smelled, the whole house just like reeked of like burned fiberglass. And I mean, just to imagine, this is fiberglass getting scorched and melted, the amount of power going through this thing, right? And so uh, this was like, the, the magic smoke really escaped this time. And I was like, hmm, okay. It's my first lesson with power electronics. Good thing I didn't die. Um, so I went on Amazon again. And the only reason I'm using Amazon is just because they ship next day and I had a client deadline that was super tight. Otherwise, all of these things can be found on Alibaba for a hell of a lot cheaper because that's where they get it from anyway, from Chinese suppliers. Um, so uh, in the meantime, I also found car exhaust tape is uh, mylarized, so it's thermally insulative. It basically like on the Hubble telescope, if you ever see that like golden garbage bag that attaches to some satellites that's uh aluminized mylar it's just a piece of plastic that has aluminum coating on one side and is reflective to heat on one side and retentive to heat on the other depending on how you face it so gold side out means it's going to insulate so i wrap the pads really well to conserve power so i can dim the amount of power that's going through the system so that i don't burn down my house um, in the meantime i found this really beefy um uh, motor motor driver for like essentially electric scooters and it can go up to 60 amps I'm like okay 60 amps is two times 30 amps <laughs> this should be fine and lo and behold it was I laid I, uh, I ran the system I even made sure and this was super important in my code I wrote this really important line that's bracketed that says don't change this please or your house will catch fire um, again this is a prototype so it's really important to um, 
to note that none of the safety uh, considerations are the best possible safety considerations in this design, and I strongly recommend you implement hardware safety cutoffs and a whole bunch of other stuff to protect yourself. Um, so basically, if I run in a full blast, the heating pads are, are so powerful, they will melt the plastic bottle itself. So I cut the power down by half, and I said, don't freaking change this. Um, below, you can see a little bit of the, um, the variables for the PID system. So PID is a, is a proportional integral, deri proportion integral der derivative system that allows you to essentially have a set point and then you have a signal that oscillates between that and you do some really fun math in order to figure out how much more power do you give the system to get to your set point and once it overshoots, how much is it going to overshoot? And if you play around with these numbers and do a little bit of math, you can actually calibrate it extremely well to your system. Um, and so I turned on the device and after very little nitpicking, um, in about less than in less than an hour, it actually stabilized at 30, 37.2 degrees Celsius, right? Like on the money. So this is a platinum electrode. Uh, it's it's my most expensive thermometer. It's like the reference for my lab. It's what I use to calibrate my PCR machines with, right? So I paid way too much money for this thermometer because I needed a standard. Um, and so I standardized it based on uh, my bioreactor based off of this. And uh, I started logging the temperatures and I let it go overnight just to make sure that the house won't catch fire because again, 60 amps is a decent amount of power. Um, and so here's something, some cool data for the data nerds. Um, this is the PID system ringing uh, overshoot. So the blue line is 37 degrees flat and the orange line is the temperature of the bioreactor. Now um, the x-axis is in seconds and 3,600 uh, 3, seconds is one hour. So within an hour, it got between, uh, between two degrees and by, by the hour 15, it got between 0.1 degrees. This tiny trash bioreactor is accurate to 0.1 degrees Celsius before um, a little bit after 12 hours, right? Which is nuts, especially for using long-lived cultures. This thing is super stable. I mean, I blew on it. I turned on the windows. I turned on the AC. It, once it stops ringing, it compensates for it beautifully. But even without the ringing, you're still within, one, within 2 degrees Celsius, which is enough for most projects. And so I, uh, I put in a, a single colony of, of RFP into four liters of LV media. Um, I turned on the device and I said, a, I said a quick prayer to every god I can think of, including some Lovecraftian horrors. And uh, the next day, lo and behold, it was super pink. I've actually never had a, a culture this rich um, with cells before, and they were all expressing RFP beautifully. I made four liters. This was my baby. I was super proud of it. Uh, I showed this to my client, and they're like, did you? Did you build a bioreactor in a week? I'm like, out of absolute desperation because I need to pay bills. Yes. Um, so you can do this in a week. I strongly don't recommend it because, as you saw, I almost burned my house down. But um, but I managed to meet the deadline using some crap I found off Amazon. Um, after that, I started doing some dialysis and crashing out the cells with chitosan. So chitosan I really like because it's a flocculating agent that doesn't inv involve aluminum. So normally. Um, in large-scale bioreactors, you need to make the cells go down, right? And you can't spin, you know, 100 liters. That's, that's ridiculous. You'll be spending so much energy on this. Um, so what you do is you use a chemical that aggregates the cells. The, that cellular aggregation breaks the, uh, the density barrier of boy, I mean the, boy, the buoyancy barrier of the cells, and they start sinking to the bottom by just adding uh, chitosan. Um, so you just let it settle in a fridge, and you start doing dialysis. And then I did the client prototype, and they were very happy. And after that, I said, man, I should have really documented how to build this, right? So I took a whole bunch of pictures, and um, um, I think uh, it was Isaac who asked me, like, hey, I heard of your bioreactor. That's really cool. Could you, uh, could you share some design files? And I said, ah, crap, I totally I forgot to document everything. So I, like, rebuilt the thing, took a bunch of pictures. This, ironically, was my least documented project because I was just in such a crunch that I wasn't going to do my usual, like, really nice documentation with steps. Uh, but I plan to do so very soon because now it's going to be potentially used in a hackathon and maybe even used in larger scales. Because the um, one nice thing about this design is that it's laminar. And you can, you can make a PCB so that everything integrates at the bottom or at the top of your, your uh, bioreactor, and they fit like blades, like server blades in a server rack. So you can have a, a bio blade rack for biology, and each one can be programmed and maybe you know pull request for a poly feature that allows the bio blade to be modulated so you can do protein production and a little bit more hardware interfacing. Whew. So um, so that's my story of all the, the, the it's just a number of the, the electronic hardware that I do. And um, if you want to know more, 
please send me an email, talk to me, call me, uh, or go on my GitHub, uh, star my GitHub. Yeah. Um, and all my files are there, especially the hardware repository, which I update often. I'm not a code monkey, I'm an electron, sparky, whatever. Um, so a lot of the stuff I do is mostly electronics. Um, so thank you so much for letting me talk. Wow. <laughs> Just wow, this is amazing. Like, you built, an you, uh, you built a bioreactor out of stuff you found in Amazon in a week that this is just mind blowing. Yeah, Tim Styles said it perfectly. This guy gets it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I just got a lot of comments here offline. Everybody is like cheering up for, and you said, and you said it perfectly for people that don't have access to all these expensive equipments. This could be groundbreaking because a lot of people, a lot of people in a lot of countries that are uh kind of a kind of stepping up their games in science they still uh don't have the financial requirements to meet for the this high pentance that that this higher that this patent equipments have or the prices nor the prices so thank you so much for this presentation I'm pretty sure this was inspired I'll inspire a lot of people to go on with their own projects and yes i want to see those files too yeah yeah definitely yeah um this is going to give me a lot of fire under my butt to to properly document this and um even upgrade it right because um, as I learn more about electronics, I also learn more about um, safety, right? And I do want this to be safe because you have four liters of, 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 of salty conductive liquid next to 60 amps running underneath it. And it's just like, it, it can't wait to set your house on fire, right? But it's, but it actually works. So it's worth putting in the effort to make this whole safe. So I'm, I'm definitely, definitely going to, uh, uh, going to focus on, on fine tuning this so that eventually it's just this rectangle that grows life and you can program it to do other, other cell lines. Yeah. Did you build up this, the, your PCR uh, machine too? Um, so like, luckily, no. Um, I have uh, I have a design for a 2-2 two -two LTA sandwich thing that I've been working on just casually. But um, some things, it's important to consider your time. So if you're paying yourself minimum wage, right, um, how much time are you going to spend rebuilding a PCR versus saving up money and buying a used one, right? So um, learning electronics is free. There are so many online open courses to, to learn enough about electronics to be able to buy used garbage equipment and turn that into, uh, into functional uh, devices better than you could build because these are built by professional engineers who have spent their lives learning about this. They built this precision crap, and this precision crap is dead because the auctioner doesn't know about fuses. You know, you replace a fuse, uh, a fuse, and uh, suddenly it now becomes a, a functional five thousand dollar PCR machine, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so the free knowledge is worth more than trying to redesign the wheel unless you absolutely have to. But then Paul Venus, the artist, did PCR by a campfire with four pots of water at different distances. So you can really deconstruct PCR into something a lot simpler because there's no reason to have a machine cost $5,000. When you look at it, it's a, it's a thermostat. It's a hot, cold, hot machine. There's absolutely no reason to pay $5,000 for a thermostat, right? Like, yeah, sure, you have machined aluminum. Like Thermo, get this, Thermo actually sells a solid silver um, ice, um, isothermal block for your PCR machines. That is literal precious metal bored in because silver has one of the highest thermal uh, conductivity ratings, so it's better, right? So rich labs have precious metals driving their science. Fuck that. Pardon my <laughs> French. Fuck that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of questions from. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> all over the place. Yeah, but I can, I, I can, I can do nothing but agree with everyone cheering for your work. You really. Is you, what you're doing is really inspirational for us uh, wannabe scientists. So Isaac uh, Guerrero wanted to know how people could learn enough of electric engineering to contribute to projects like yours. Cool. Um, so I, I first started with uh, the module mentality, right? So um, the maker revolution or the maker movement made a lot of uh, people a ton of money because they take their electrical engineering know-how and they packetize circuits into something that's, that's accessible for Arduino, so like Lego for electronics. And so I, I learned by, buy, by buying these devices and uh, connecting them together like the Cabbage Babbage. There was no custom circuits. It was just stuff off, off Amazon, again, connecting them together, putting in some code. The code 
code was free, the parts were cheap, but you're limited in scope to what modules you can find. So uh, as you as you start di digging in for modules, like there's there's pH meter modules, there are light sensor modules, there's thermostats, like you name it, chances are they'll have it. Like oxygen, uh, CO2 sensors, right? Um, all of those exist as Arduino modules, and it's a wonderful time to actually start electrical engineering. But what I highly recommend is as you obtain these modules, um, try to reverse engineer it. Try to look at it and understand what's happening. Don't black box this because as soon as you remove the lid of that black box, you start understanding that you can make it yourself and you also don't have to charge 20 pay twenty dollars for it it'll cost you like a dollar right to do the same thing it'll allow you uh, and empower you to do your own custom circuits in this in a smaller platform let's say you have five modules that you really love if they're open source and well documented the schematics are online right and you could just pull all the schematics together order a PCB solder it together and now you have all the bits and pieces so um, I would, for the people who are academic and bookish, I would recommend taking um, an online course in electrical engineering. Uh, there's one from Coursera called um, uh, Linear Circuit Al Analysis 1, and uh, that one is by, I think, uh, Georgia Tech. It's exceptional, right? It's a little tough. It's cal it's, it uses calculus, but you will learn electrical engineering as if you're uh, an undergrad. Um, there are tons of free stuff on on um, on YouTube that'll show you. There's one wonderful YouTube blog called the EEV blog, Dave Jones, the electrical um, electrical engineering and design blog, and he has these these fundamentals Fridays where they go, what is a capacitor? What is a resistor? And then he does teardowns. He talks about like like really highbrow um, uh, corporate stuff about electronics. It's it's for electrical engineers, but it's also for the learners. Right? And their blog, the eevblog.com, is exceptional. It's some of the best uh, electrical, uh, it's the equivalent of an electronic stack exchange with people that actually give a damn about you learning. Right? It's like a really nice community and um, electrical engineering has about like 80 years of, of, of maturity and, and above like biology. So expect things to be well documented and hopefully, um, and uh, the, all the data sheets are really well established and it's essentially, um, one of the, the, the most beautiful programming languages for interfacing with the actual hardware, right? Like the language of electrons. And it's, it's something, I mean, I can wax poetic about it, but honestly, I love it. I love it to death. Uh, mm -hmm. Not as much as I love flowers, but oh my God, is it useful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Actually, I just saved the name of the course. It's Annette, it's uh, Electrical Engineering, ele uh, the Coursera one about uh, circuit circuits, What's yeah, circuit again? analysis. Yeah, so uh, it's linear circuit analysis. Linear right? circuit analysis, and who's the person yeah. who did it? Um, oof, it's from Georgia Tech. Yeah, okay. uh, that's all. That's all I remember. And I mean, if you pay the seventy bucks, you'll get a certificate. Um, I went through the entire the entire courseware, and um, I'm actually enrolled. So here's something that's really interesting. If you want to go, um, if you want to get a job in electrical engineering. There's, there's this really amazing opportunity. So I have no formal degree whatsoever. I have no undergrad. I, I, the only formal diploma I have is a high school degree. Now, uh, recently, as of March 2020, um, Colorado University at Boulder started an online only master's in electrical engineering with no prerequisites, none. You don't need a, a by uh, um, an electrical engineering background. You don't need anything. You just need to maintain a B average across your courses. And it's, um, I think it was like $10,010 flat, no other fees. And it's a full master's, 30 courses, super rigorous. It'll beat you up. I'm getting my ass kicked. Um, but it is, uh, it is an honest to, uh, honest to goodness uh, online master's and it's automated. And then the, um, the courses are through a proctor that, uh, that is established through the university. It's all super accessible. And literally it's the only master's program that doesn't require a prerequisite, right? So I'm in a grad program as a high school graduate and I'm not special. This is just literally just teaching myself prior electrical engineering, taking undergraduate courses online. Those two courses that I mentioned, uh, linear circuits, one DC circuits and AC circuits, right? Those two. Um, and then immediately followed in and I'm doing, I'm doing okay. You know, I'm floating. Um, but uh, the embedded systems track is what I'm taking because I love building embedded systems. I love uh, building sensors and, and robots. I want to build a robot to one day uh, remotely go to Antarctica and bring samples back. That's like the <laughs> ultimate goal. Uh, big, it's big, basically going to look like trash. So it's going to be this trash heap with a solar panel that's going to float its way to Antarctica. Um, but um, but yeah, there, there are ways if you want to, unlike biology where there's barely any way to actually do online biology to get a B-Sci, you can get a B-A, 
but a lot of master's programs and PhD programs require a BSci, right? Um, the, unlike biology, this one requires zero experience. You go straight from zero to master's if you want to. So mm -hmm. shameless plug for Colorado, go, uh, go Buffaloes. Um, yeah. Uh, well, time to, time to enroll, guys. That's it. Let everybody get a master's degree in electrical engineering. Yeah, right. So yeah. second question. Um, Radhakrishna Sanka, I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, wanted to know, I'm curious. You got it right. I got it right? Damn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know where you're seeing scaling prob problems with your projects. Scaling, okay. Um, so with the BioBlade, the, the, one of the main scaling is uh, thermal control, right? So because they're next to each other and you want different temperature gradients, you're going to need to insulate on both sides, right? And you're going to need airflow to cool it such that they don't overheat, right? So you would actually need a forced air system. So if you have um, multiple blades, like if you take a, a single server, a blade server, you can run it. But if you have three or four next to each other, it needs forced air. Um, so you can design a chassis like an IKEA rack with a bunch of fans blowing on it and then drive the actual panels at higher power because you definitely can. I mean, they, the, the panels can heat to melting. You can definitely manage forced air blowing through it. Um, and that way you can have a library. Like I imagine like a, a, a bookshelf of bio blades. You can also scale it down. You don't need to do four liters. Imagine one liter small bottles with heaters on them. Um, but beyond that point, this is like a small to medium scale. If you want to do anything larger, um, brewing machinery is wonderful, right? Like large, large scale, like 50, 50, 100 gallons. That's, that's technically low to medium scale in industry. They do like, you know, hundreds of gallons. But, um, but for, for smaller stuff, I would suggest just getting a, a beer brewing system and then dropping in a couple of those like water heating rods, right? So you'd have to reinvent the, the, the system. But for small scale, especially for amateur work, if you have like 10 cell lines that have different plasmids and you just want to run them real quick, um, this is wonderful, yeah. I was thinking going even smaller actually, because scale is basically a function of how, what is your test sample volume, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was talking to the Frenzymes folks about figuring out if we can do like a millifluidic reactor and stuff. And I think what do you guys, what you guys are building is perfect over here in terms of we just figured out how to stick in like ml uh quantities right like 100 ml or 200 ml yeah. reactors with millifluidics and we can probably get a lot of cool things done yeah um especially because millifluidics are flat right so you have a yeah. lot of surface area to heat and then if you really want to like um like I, I would love to do directed evolution on sacrophiles that love cold so you can put a peltier cooling device mm -hmm. on top of your millifluidics and keep it super chill um yeah so like scaling up is really difficult scaling down would be super interesting i'd love to collaborate on that like really yeah no uh, let's uh let's actually chat i'm on the friendzymes chat i'll we'll cool. figure out ways to communicate sure man uh, more yeah, let's, than let's make this pro sulfur you are, I know. We are like, going good in this, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have the bio people, we have the microfluidics people, I guess, from my yeah. side, and we have the <laughs> other peripherals folks. I think, yeah, I think we can do some really cool things. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and if, if there's anything to take home from this, it's uh, A, you can definitely build stuff. B, uh, electrical engineering knowledge is extremely empowering for everyone. If you're a synthetic biologist and you know a bit of electrical, it's it's wonderful. But the the most important part is that like, the the concepts are simple, right? It's easy to learn, hard to master because like you know you can do uh, analog black magic and do like uh, the stuff that uh, Eric Ryder, who's one of the the folks here in the in the background, um, he does incredible stuff with with analog work and does all kinds of electrical engineering stuff and really cool instruments. That comes with years and years and years of experience. But to get the base uh, the baseline stuff to get stuff working now is the absolute best time to do uh, to do electrical. Indeed, indeed, indeed is the best time. I already see people looking for the things you recommended to us. So, um, I, Isaac wanted to, Isaac Larkin wanted to know uh, if you had any tips for measuring DNA concern, concentration <laughs> slash purity on the cheap. Oh boy. Okay. So, <laughs> on the cheap. Um, so then the number one rule is you get what you pay for with electronics, right? Unfortunately, right? The higher the quality stuff, uh, the more it costs, right? But it scales, it, it scales pretty nicely. Now, um, 
there, I, so I have this design for, uh, for using gel green, a blue LED. This basically, I took my transilluminator and turned it into a tube holder. And then I hooked up an Arduino to it to measure the light intensity with a very, very sensitive light chip. Um, but that light chip is still not sensitive enough to measure the nanograms per microliter level, right? So I'm getting it to around like, yes or no, is it 100 microgram, nanograms per microliter, right? Um, but the, the case in point is that it's linear with, with, uh, with respect to light intensity. So you can, so essentially what I'm gonna do, because I might as well just say it, uh, I'm gonna rip off the qubit because all they do is a blue light and a photodiode and a really, really uh, expensive uh, analog to digital converter that can measure down to like borderline photons. Um, uh, that the light sensor, well, it allow the light sensor to measure to like almost photons, uh, single photons. And um, once you have that, you can definitely measure on the cheap. I mean, like LED light chip Arduino, right? And really, really good analog digi digital chip. That's about like four or five bucks a chip type of thing. Yeah. So yeah, so you can really, you can break it down further. The, the issue is that like, if it's mission critical, finding a used qubit might actually be worth it. But if you have access to absolutely nothing, your Algaros gel is incredibly informative. If you buy a mass ladder, right, which, which is something that I would love to make, um, a mass ladder shows intensities, not just sizes, but, in, but the, the actual concentration of each one as a brightness. And you can eyeball the concentration with a mass ladder. You can put in your sample and say, how bright is this? And then you can program a computer vision system, super simple one, to measure the amount of light intensity between the two bands and give you a, a more accurate read than any hardware that you can cobble together with an, an, a novice's electrical engineering understanding. Um, so yeah, so worst case, use your gel, right? And like for me, like whenever I do nanopore sequencing, I always run it on a gel because it tells me so much about shearing, about RNA, about how massive the bands are, I mean, how massive the DNA is that it won't even come down from the gel. There's a lot of ways to use older technologies and reliable technologies to do inferences on the molecular scale. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very, very much. Also, I agree. There's a nice shaker on your bench there. <laughs> yeah. So this this was like I think a hundred bucks with the blown fuse. Um, people don't know about fuses on eBay. A lot of the people who sell au uh, auction stuff, they, they just say broken as is. If it's a device like a PCR machine, chances are it makes beep codes, like it actually beeps, and mm -hmm. ask them if it's beeping, download the service manual and see what's wrong with it. And if it's like something dumb like a CMOS battery, you can replace that for like a dollar. And now you took a $200 gamble and turned it into a $2,000 functional machine. Like nine out of 10 times, it's a blown fuse and it just doesn't turn on because of it. Sometimes it's worth it. Like I got a $20 PCR machine that I flipped for 1,200 because I proved that it works and I put it on eBay saying uh, ver verified, refurbished and tested. And my refurbishing is I replaced a single fuse, right? Whoa. So like, yeah, so like 20 bucks in, 1,500 out, pretty decent racket to be honest. Very, very decent. Actually, I, I got one question of my own here. Do you sure. only use Arduino for your electrical projects or do you use any other kind of hardware boards for, for it? Because I, I got an you... Arduino here and I'm looking at it and it's looking back at me and I'm waiting for the bioreactor to show up. <laughs> so um, it's, it's funny that you asked. So as my skills in electrical engineering increase, um, so does my confidence of going away from Arduino. Arduino was the nice sandbox for me to play in. Um, currently, I'm actually spinning my own microcontroller board using the latest ultra low voltage 32-bit uh, processors from STM. Uh, it's the STM32L0. And uh, that one has a ton more memory, a ton more space, many more pins. It's just, it's overall better than the Arduino chips. Um, and STM, in their brilliant wisdom, decided to make a library to make their microcontrollers Arduino-like. So you use the Arduino code, but the hardware is the, the latest and greatest super fast stuff that's less power and hundreds of times faster than, than the Arduino, right? Um, but to be honest, for like, almost everything that you might want as an amateur, chances are you're going to just use an Arduino and it's totally fine. Like I use an Arduino Mega for my Cabbage Babbage, for the, um, uh, for the BioBlade, uh, I use an Arduino Uno, um, sorry, I use an Arduino Mini, which I got for like a dollar on and in China, like 10, 10 at $1 a piece, um, for the single, single shot. Yeah, I mean, I really like it. I'd like to expand. Um, I'm doing really dumb things like learning um, <clears throat> uh, ARM assembly 
right, in Risk Five. So I'm like learning like super, super like bare metal programming to make ultra fast sensors. Um, but you don't need to do that. You can just stay in the Arduino sandbox. And um, the other thing I'd like to recommend, um, Adafruit, right? So Adafruit is a company based here in New York, and uh, Lenore, who runs it, is uh, one of the coolest people I've ever met. Uh, she's got pink hair. Uh, she is like the biggest um, proponent of. Um, of the maker movement, but like serious, seriously, like they want people to be empowered and to learn. And so they designed a thing called the circuit playground and it allows you to code Python on microcontrollers. It's called MicroPython, right? So uh, the Adafruit circuit playground, that entire ecosystem will bridge uh, all the computer nerds in, in the audience will bridge the Python understanding with the hardware uh, periphery, right? Pipe that into, um, um, I mean, and, but more importantly, all of these devices will also allow you to bootload other particular languages, right? So I'd love to see if I can get um, some type of a, of a Rust system going, right? So there's, um, there's an operating system for microcontrollers and old computers called Forth that people have been developing strongly. Uh, and I could, I could recommend that as well. But I mean, I'd love to see Go on a microcontroller. That would be so sick. Yeah, Tiny Go. There it goes. Tiny Go. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so Adafruit Circuit Playground, and then just explore microcontrollers in Python. There's there's so many, and if TinyGo works, awesome. Yeah. Great. Good good to know that I can stay on my Arduino sandbox while I learn the Tiger the kite the Tiger and the Circuit Playground here. Yeah. 